So there is an element of all these people, and this is a process which continues through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, right up to, if you like, the opening up of the economy in 1991. And the opening up of the economy in 1991, and if you like, the, the media revolution which follows in its wake, brings artists and what they're doing into much closer contact, both nationally and internationally with other artists, as a result of which, newer practices get drawn into the mainstream quicker. So somebody producing video art, such as a Nalani Malani, or a Ramin Kaleka, or an Abjot al would have been working in isolation for much longer had it not been for these factors. And in the process of this, they get drawn into the mainstream art scene much quicker than they would have. So it doesn't really stand out as an avant-garde, and it's only in the mid-2000s, by the mid-2000s, with the market taking over absolutely every area of cultural production, absolutely every sphere, if you like, that alternative spaces begin to emerge. And it's with the emergence of the alternative spaces do we get, if you like, a true return to the avant-garde. Because then you have people whose basic reaction is against the market, is an opposition to the economics of that, where they, where they stand for, if you like, the purity of the art object and doing it for the sake of creating something which they feel is significant and which necessary which is not necessarily sellable because a lot of it even um, is is consumed into the economics of the of, of the art market and galleries are beginning to get into these spaces more and more and have become significant players as a result of which artists are producing even work which would otherwise be considered avant-garde for the market and this also ties in with the rise of, if you like, Indian participation in major international art events, the coming of curators. I don't think too many curators visited before the early 2000s. Um, and and there, were, there was very little Indian participation before the first significant uh, exhibition, which was, which was curated by Gita Kapoor and the Tate in 2000. So India then gets put onto the international map, if you like. And with being put on the international map, there is a regression because in order to cater to these sensibilities, there is a sense of a return to the exotic. And, and artists feel that they, in order to, to come to the notice of these curators, they have to produce works which are identifiably Indian. And in doing and in producing works which are identifiably Indian, they abandon the quest for the new, for the radical, for the subversive and return to traditional motives and traditional ideas, but repackaging them in a way which is acceptable, almost sanitized, right. for branded, completely branded, and sanitized and, and, and made more palatable for an audience which is not familiar with the subtleties and nuances of the artwork. Um, so, uh, of, of that of the specific culture, if you like. And, because, um, and I think this is, this, is, this is something that we see beginning in 2000, and toward, as I said, towards the mid-2000s with the emergence of artist collectives like Rouge and, uh, and some other very significant collectives, we see, if you like, a turning away from this exoticism and this pandering to certain tastes. And I think that's where the, the real emergence of the avant-garde starts to come in. And and art students tend to get more and more exposure to newer ideas. That having been said, the academic curriculum still remains very much rooted in the trade schools of the 1990s, of the, of the 1890s, Baroda being an exception to this, uh, but not a very great exception. And artists, even if we look around at, at this exhibition, which, which features the work of young artists, there's very little new media work. There is no new media work, as a matter of fact. And Artists in, in, in art school are not willing to produce new media work because they're told by their teachers, by galleries who are visiting, by, if I may say so, curators, that what are you going to do with it? Because they, it's, it's, it's felt that they haven't reached a level of seniority. Okay, talking about the, the, the most sort of cutting edge work going on in the world today, the very best Indian artists, and there are many you know, really wonderful Indian artists on the global scene, with the exception, I think, of Rex, there are none who, who are interested in challenging what art can be, which is, which is the way you would define avant-garde or uh, art today. 
and I don't know why that is, but I would put it back to you all as to why. I, mean, I think that you started to get to, you know, it just doesn't seem to be what, what is of interest to you. Uh, and that's a process, it, that's all. As a culture, we play safe. And, and I think the problem is in the fact that we've been playing safe for far too long. Because every time there's some sort of innovation, the very fact that it becomes sellable and the very fact that it becomes acceptable means that people are then producing more and more of that rather than thinking that, oh, how can I think conceptually beyond this? How can I address these issues in a manner? Because ultimately, if, if, if they were to abandon the idea of the artwork as a sellable commodity and think about art for, its, for the sake of pushing a conceptual boundary, it would necessarily mean withdrawing yourself from the forces of does it, anybody else like to respond to this notion of this, this, this collapsing notion of our that? I think your argument about uh, that moment, 2000, the year 2000, that uh, it made it very easy when, when the boom came for the production of a lot of really bad work, which was able to uh, be consumed by the market. And uh, therefore, <coughs> like a lot of us feel, it was a good thing that the boom was short and sweet. <laughs> not short enough, not. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think we can see that happening again all over the world. It happened in Italy in the 1980s with the rise of neo-expressionism. It happened in many cultures where the, the, consumpting, the consuming power of the, of the emerging collector class made it possible for artists uh, to, uh, to generate and sell whatever they wanted to a voracious market. And so one of the things we can see is that the market is both something to be delighted in. I mean, what artist doesn't like the idea of being able to make a living off of their work? I mean, you know, visiting China in the early days of that boom, it was very hard to, to look askance at an artist who grew up in extreme poverty and under unbelievably oppressive times during the Cultural Revolution who was now making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year selling repeated paintings that they've made a hundred times. But you couldn't, you couldn't be looked down on them for wanting to all of a sudden have some wealth and, and sell these pictures that the world seemed to be clamoring for, and yet there was a certain kind of sadness. The same thing in the former Soviet Union, that all the energy was kind of let out. And I wonder if there's a sense of, of that kind of sense of loss uh, when, there, when there isn't an impetus to avant-garde, to challenge the notion of, of what art might be about. One of the things I noticed uh, in this show and looking around is that in, in the European and American scene, the influence of conceptual art, that is to say art that has an ontological goal of questioning the, the idea of what art is, uh, seems to have passed by. Or if it didn't pass by, it seems to have been quickly ingested and rejected here. Because I don't see, even within the academy, and conceptual art is now an academic form, you know, it's been 40 years since. Uh, so John Baldessari and people like that brought up ideas of conceptual art as teachers. Uh, but still, even there, I don't see that an academic version even of conceptual art uh, inflected in the art that I'm seeing coming out of the academies. And then again, maybe a problem of, of the way the academy is structured, the way tenure is structured, the way uh, the, you know, the bureaucracy of the, of the Indian Art Academy works. But I, I can't say. Would, would you like to respond to that? Yes, it, it, was, it was something that I was thinking of earlier, and I think you said that uh, some of the avant-garde artists joined the academies, and their students, therefore, absorbed some of these elements and carried them forward. Yeah. I think that we, we do have, still in our academies, this carrying forward of the avant-garde of, of a few decades ago. The 1950s. Exactly. So, so if you see the works from Bengal, they still carry a very strong element of, of the kind of uh, socialist concerns of that point of time. If you see the works from Baroda, there is a language that you know comes from uh, people like Jira <coughs> Patel and uh, uh, you know Nasri Muhammadi and his son. So you can <coughs> see that kind of connection. So I suppose that uh, the solution now is for the current avant-garde to join the academy as teachers. <laughs> More than that. Uh, at, at this point, I would like to open up the, uh, the, the conversation to you in the audience and have your comments or questions. And so if you like, I'll pass this microphone out to the audience if there's somebody who would like to pass it around. 
And please feel free to, uh, to share what's on your mind or ask questions of any of us on the panel. share something funny with you as a friend. For instance, um, we have a slight order of scissor as a motive. So when I started using them, I thought it was a little amaga, you know. And uh, then I have, for instance, gallery people who say, I sometimes uh, have blood in the work. So I've had a couple of galleries saying, Oh, but if you do it, that's a beautiful work. But if you were to remove the blood, you would take it. And then I say, no, it's an integral part. So then I think that I'm doing something out of God by sticking to my blood and my scissor. So I may be harboring that illusion that every day I'm trying to do something that I didn't do yesterday. And I can assure you that the market is far from many people's minds when they paint. It's the sheer passion the pleasure, the ecstasy. The market is not never, never, never in their thoughts. That I can assure. I'm Johnny Emel. I'm the managing editor of uh, Art and Day magazine published from Delhi. Um, <clears throat> this question of avant-garde, as all of you mentioned, it's a problematic and it remains to be problematic. But as far as uh, Indian art scene is concerned, I believe avant-garde, the notion of avant-garde is dead. When we talk about avant-garde, we have to take two things into consideration. One, avant-garde as a theoretical proposition and avant-garde as a historical notion. If we consider it as a theoretical proposition, as Anjit Jari mentioned, uh, this has been there in all the time, in the, in, in the, in the, in the history of modern Indian art history. Avant-garde has always been there. But if we talk about it in the context of Indian, Indian art scene, if we talk about it as a historical category, avant-garde as a historical category, we can clearly say that it started sometime in the 80s when the Baroda School of Artists under the leadership of Gulam Muhammad Sheikh, Bhupat Gakkar, K.G. Subramanian and Lord started this Naraji movement. And it was almost the same time by the end of the 80s, we started talking about the immaterial art. And with the end of, with the demise of uh, K.P. Krishna Kumar, who was the leader of Radical Indian Radical, Radical Painters and Sculptors Association, in 1988-89, when he committed suicide, as a reaction to that particular incident, Vivan Sundaram put one uh, piece of wood across his canvas and he said, painting is dead. So this was exactly by the end of 90s. So that's why we call it Vivankart, not Avankart. In India we call it Vivankart because it is started by Vivankart. Maybe that is, in, in that terms, as a historical category, if, uh, this Avankart process started in, uh, in India by the end of 80s. But unfortunately, the, the, the idea of Avankart and the idea of postmodernism was collapsed into one and immediately taken over by the notion called contemporary art, which of course all of you know that is eaten, subsumed, obsessed, and possessed by the market scene. That is the post-91, the post-global scenario. And as we all know, avant-garde is something that is forward-moving, and it is eaten by the people who follow, and subsumed by who has already gone ahead. So market system is something that is subsuming it, co-opting it, adopting it in a faster pace. So I don't think like there is a possibility of avant-garde anymore. And if at all there is a possible possibility, I would say that is there in Facebook, in uh, in all the networking sites, in blogs, and things like that. 